What's up guys, Eli here, back for another CD collection video, kind of, uh, I guess you could say the, the flagship uh, video series for this channel. It's basically why I started the channel, just to kind of go through my CD collection, which I have been steadily. Um, you know, I'm a big CD guy, it's my favorite format, so these are, this is probably my favorite, you know, series that I do out of uh, all the series that I do. But anyways, as always, if you're new to this channel, uh, I do 10 CDs at a time out of my, you know, loosely alphabetized collection and just kind of, you know, rant about each one for maybe a, a minute or so and uh, yeah, let's get it started. Starting with the 2002 debut of this Russian black metal band, um, I don't think anyone knows how to pronounce this, um, <laughs> I'll do my best, uh, if, if Dabkuth Klifoff? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's not Russian or anything. It's just some, some kind of weird occult uh, type shit. But so yeah, this uh, this band formed in 2001, uh, Russia, like I said, by a guy named Ash uh, Alish Tor, um, and he's pretty much been at the helm of the band for most of the time. Like I said, this is the first album from 2002. There's there's other releases. It came out on Misanthropic Propaganda Productions. You know, this is the kind of black metal that I like. It's very kind of droning, repetitive kind of almost like trance inducing if you will and it's 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 simple but effective very atmospheric and i'd be curious to look into more i've never heard anything else from them so yeah anyone else into uh <laughs> should i do it again if dabkuth cliffoff i i'm literally never gonna say that again as as long as i live but uh check them out because they're pretty cool Next, we have the debut full-length album from Isengard, or as Fenris himself calls it, Isengard. Uh, how do you pronounce this? Uh, Host Morke? Isengard is like a folk black metal band. Uh, started in 89, went through about 95 originally. Uh, it's just a Fenris from Dark Throne solo project. And it is like a more of a folk black metal. I guess some people even say like a black, black death folk. I just say folk black metal. Um, you know, most of the tracks are pretty folky. Some of them are, you know, at times I hear just straight up black metal, you know, in the way that, uh, you know, someone from Dark Throne would do. And I have this really cool double disc, um, uh, Peaceville version with, uh, disc two, which is the complete album with Fenris doing commentary. Uh, just like they did with all those Dark Throne albums, they re-released them with Fenris, just, uh, <laughs> Fenris doing 90% of the talking and then Nocturnal Cult will chime in every now and then. I gotta say, these days, those are my favorite ways to listen to those Dark Throne albums. And and this one's no different. Uh, <laughs> Fenris is always cool to listen to. I'm a huge Dark Throne fan. I, I'm not maybe a massive Isengard fan, but I do think it's cool. I'm not one of those people that's against, you know, folk elements and black metal. I think I think the, the two go together perfectly, and I've never had a problem with it. And, uh... Fenris does it surprisingly well, and he did it really early on, like I said, as early as 89, recorded from 94 to 95, so it came out in 95, and yeah, I mean, I dig it, not something I reach for often, but uh, if you're going to get this album, if you don't have it, if you're down with the folk black metal, definitely get this Peaceville version, you know, with the, the cool rounded jewel cases. I I, I love Peaceville's packaging, but uh, yeah, you got to hear Fenris talk about it, it just, <laughs> just makes the album a lot more fun to listen to. And I've got the debut uh, full-length album from Japan's Intestine Ballism. Uh, this band was formed in 1992. Uh, last thing they did was a full-length album in 2008, so they're apparently still active, but I, I don't know. I don't know when the next uh, time we'll hear from them will be. So this is the debut from 97, An Anatomy of the Beast, it's called. This came out on Repulsed, or Repulse Records, a Spanish record label. Now, Intestine Ballism... They, they kind of had a lot of talk in the uh, the mid two thousands, so they you know they kind of had some hype going on, and I always felt like they they you know they deserved that hype very much. They would they play what I would call a at their the core of their sound is melodic death metal. Um, you know clearly they probably took some inspiration from you know the Swedish scene bands like At the Gates and stuff, but they added kind of a touch of brutality. Um, I mean, At The Gates are pretty brutal at times, but, uh, you know, Intestine Ballism kind of did it the Japanese way, if you will. Kind of, I, I would almost liken it to Japanese horror movies, which I'm a big fan of. You know, the Japanese did not invent horror movies, but they, you know, they made their own style of horror, and it was just 
you know, <laughs> if you've seen any Japanese horror movies, you know what I'm talking about. Just completely shocking, fucked up, and depraved. And that's kind of what intestine ballism do. They took, you know, they took a genre like melodic death metal, but they added this, like, almost, like, almost a side dish of brutal death metal. And I don't think anyone else was really quite doing it that way. And I don't, I don't know if anyone's ever done it since. I've never heard a band quite like them. But when it comes to melodic death metal, I think they're one of the best. Then from 2001, I have the debut and only album from Internasign, titled The Book of Lambs. came out on Hammerheart Records. Now, if you don't know anything about Internasign, uh, this band was active from 97 till about 2002 or so. Uh, started in Ohio, later Florida. Uh, and the band was helmed by uh, Jared Anderson, who would recruit, like, uh, I think Tony Loreno and Derek Roddy both played drums on this album, different tracks. Uh, and Eric Rutan of Morbid Angel and Hate Eternal plays all the solos. And this, I imagine this band probably would have uh, gone a little longer. Jesus Christ. <laughs> this thing is just, I've had it a long time. It's completely busted up. Uh, I think they would have gone a little bit longer, but Jared Anderson would actually pass away. I believe it was from cancer. Um, it, was, it was a pretty sad story. Uh, this is a good album. I, I really dig it, actually. It, if you're not a fan of Hate Eternal, you know, you might not like this. It, it to me, it very much sounds like a Hate Eternal album. Um, you could say maybe even a little bit of Morbid Angel. I think Jared clearly was a big Morbid Angel fan. He actually he actually filled in. Uh, he was Morbid Angel's uh, vocalist and bassist on on a tour. I can't remember in the early two thousands or something like that. So, uh, you know, he was really good friends with Eric Rutan. Like I think they were best friends actually. So Eric uh, took it really hard when Jared died. I've heard he was a great guy. But uh, anyways, yeah, brutal kind of you know. Brutal kind of early two thousands esque Florida death metal. Like I said, if you like Hate Eternal, this is a this is a mandatory listen. From what I've heard, it's kind of hard to come by these days. Uh, I've had it for a long time. Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe check Discogs. Probably you could use a repress, and I don't know why that hasn't ever happened because this is definitely kind of a cult classic. But uh, yeah, I think it's really good. And from 2000, that's right, I say 2000. I, I, I get kind of hate when people say the year 2000. Like, you don't say the year 1998, but whenever someone brings up 2000, they always have to say the year 2000. But anyways, the 2000 debut from Denmark's Iron Fire Thunderstorm. Note the very cool, always cool Necro Lord cover art. Now, Iron Fire, they're still active to this day. They've been consistent, but I've never heard anything beyond their second album. But this one, I really dig. Clearly, it's power metal. Uh, if you remember in the early 2000s, early to mid 2000s, there was this wave, this huge wave of like power metal, like a uh, European power metal revival, I think you could probably call it. it uh, it's probably still going, but I mean, it was really booming. It's all these power metal bands were just coming out of nowhere, you know, sounding like Halloween. Uh, and this band is no different. They sound like Halloween, just like almost all those guys did. But I think. Um, I think they stand above just a little bit. And, you know, this band, this album in particular, uh, garnered quite a bit of hype. People were talking about this, uh, and you know, for good reason. I, you know, I really dig this. When I, when I want to hear power metal, you know, I grab this pretty often. Um, they formed in 1995, and, you know, if you like Halloween, I think you'll dig this. There's The vocals are good. Maybe, I don't know if I'd say I love them, but, they're the, you know, the, the singer... He's serviceable. He's a decent power metal vocalist. Um, but the riffs are so catchy. The riffs are just great. The band, you know, they're tight. They play very well. You know, great solos. Um, it's just great European power metal if you like that kind of thing. There's a lot of keyboards and, you know, fast double bass. And, uh, I mean, it sounds like the album cover. If you like power metal that sounds like this, you know, I think Iron Fire, you could do a lot worse. And then I got a couple uh, couple releases by a band called Jobladov. Now Jobladov, this was just one guy out of the U.S. active from '95 till around 2014 or so, helmed by a man named James Harlow. Uh, this is the fifth album. It's called Primland, and this came out in 2008. Now Jobladov sound very much like uh, I think it was no secret that he really loved the band Weakling. I think uh, yeah, there's a strong 
strong weakling sound on here, maybe even a little early burzum. Uh, you know, if you like black metal that sounds like that. And all done by one guy. And I gotta say, I mean, he did a really good job. Uh, and he was a super nice guy. He actually passed away, um, God, I can't remember, five years ago, maybe a little bit more. It was really sad. He was super nice to me. He befriended me on, on Facebook, uh, God, probably around the time that this came out. Um, and he just took a liking to me for some reason. We would talk back and forth. And I, I hadn't talked to him for a long time, if I'm being honest. And uh, I, I'd been messaging him on Facebook, like, hey, man, you know, we've lost touch. I want to reconnect. And sadly, I got a, a message from, I believe, his, was his wife. And uh, she told me that he had passed. Like, I think he was only like 50 years old or something like that. And, uh, I, you know, really good guy. You know, he's. I think he's uh, definitely will be sorely missed. But, yeah, if you like that kind of black metal... Look into Job Ladov. He's got a bunch of other albums. He did ambient stuff. Um, from what I understand, his last couple albums were uh, very kind of experimental style black metal. Not that that's a style, but experimental type black metal. I haven't heard it. Those last few albums, I just, um, you know, since after hearing that he passed, I just almost kind of, I don't know, I, I've I've had a, a, I've struggled to to pursue those albums for some reason. But maybe, maybe someday I'll look into them and, uh, you know, I'll give them a shot. And the only other Jabladov thing I have is this one right here. This is uh, it's called Com uh, Communion with Mother and Machine, and this is a pure ambient album. It came out in 2010, and it was his ninth album. I like how he hand-numbered it with the gold pen. It's really cool, limited to 100 copies, and I really dig this, actually. Um, I don't listen to a lot of ambient stuff, but this one is really, really good. It's very repetitive, which is the way I like my ambient music. It's, uh, you know, he did some field, took some field recordings uh, where he lives, uh, I think he was in North Carolina, if I remember correctly, and he was, a, he was very into the outdoors, uh, you know, so he, he had some field recordings up in the mountains of, uh, what are those mountains called? He would always talk about them, Blue Ridge or something like that. I can't remember those mountains, but they're beautiful. <laughs> Anyways, did some field recordings, you know, looped, you know, did some loops and added some other, you know, atmospherics. However you make ambient music, I don't fucking know, but I, I like this. You know, it, it might, uh, like I said, it's very repetitive. There's not a whole lot going on through the runtime, but it's, it's very trance inducing. It's very calming. Uh, I dig it. In fact, you know, I'm going to have to, I'm gonna have to listen to it again soon because I, I just, I enjoy it. Don't listen to a lot of ambient music. I've actually always wanted to listen to more ambient music. I just don't know where to, I don't know where to start or where to, I don't know. I, I have a hard time even narrowing down what it, what it is that I like about specific ambient music. Like, I love early Tangerine Dream or even most Tangerine Dream that I've heard. Uh, so if anyone wants to recommend to me some, you know, some Tangerine Dream-esque ambient music, I really like the, you know, the naturistic sounding stuff, very repetitive and kind of, you know, the trance-inducing shit. Uh, yeah, throw some recommendations my way if you would like. From 1976, I have the second album from bass player Jocko Pastorius. Uh, I got this a couple of years back, and, you know, I'll admit, I don't know much about this kind of stuff. This is uh, jazz fusion, I guess you would say. This is considered an all-time classic, um, you know, one of the just a fan favorite jam, uh, jazz fusion album. Uh, it was the second album, if I said that, or if I didn't say that. And yeah, so Jocko, he played with uh, people like Miles Davis and Weather Report and uh, probably many, many others that I don't know about. Um, I, I've only listened to this once. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm very new to the jazz fusion genre. Uh, I like a lot of what I heard. It's definitely a genre that interests me. I, I like the fusion stuff a little bit more than jazz because it's a little bit more... Um, you know, a little bit more, I don't know, a little bit more rocking, I guess. It's easier for me to get into. So Jocko was considered, uh, he was considered one of the best, if not the best bass players of all time. Uh, he, he just blew people's minds. He sadly died, uh, I don't know when it was. Okay, it says right here, 1987. He had a drug problem. He was living in New York City. He had, he had a huge drug problem. You can hear... A lot of stories I, I even have of, of, you know, him playing in the New York City area, uh, you know, around the time of his death and just, just, just so messed up on drugs. Um, it, it sucks for people to, for those to be people's last memories of him, seeing him walking around the city, just absolutely, uh, you know, basically dying. But, uh, you know, the mark he left 
musically, uh, well, you know, from what I gather, will never be forgotten. Uh, you know, if you if you're a jazz fusion fan, you'll know, <laughs> you'll already know. But if if you're not, you know, you've probably heard the name, and if you haven't, you will hear it at some point because he is, uh, you know, his work was that uh, revered. From 2004, we have the ninth album from Jag Panzer, Casting the Stones, came out on Century Media. Jag Panzer are a very, very cult, well-loved power metal band out of the U.S. They played, they were one of the bands that, you know, would play that U.S. style of power metal in the very early 80s. Uh, you know, they're still going to this day, you know, maybe they're not as active as they used to be, but they formed in 81 in Colorado by John Tetley, Mark Briotti, Rick Hilliard, and uh, Harry the Tyrant Conklin on vocals. Um, Harry's gone on to do a number of projects, including, uh, oh, what's that one with uh, Metal of Hell? Um, something Hell. <laughs> he has this other, this other kind of power metal band, a uh, really interesting story, because they, what was that band called? I don't know, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll look it up after this video. Uh, yeah, he's in this other power metal band, Satan's, uh, something about Satan. It's kind of cool, like it started off a, uh, you know, another early U.S. power metal band. Um, you know, Harry left the band at one point in the early 90s, something like that, and they would become this, like, a black death metal band. Uh, then Harry would come back years later in the, you know, mid-2000s, and they would come back and kind of compromise the two styles. It would be a a power metal, but they would keep like the the black death riffing and stuff, and it's it's interesting. I I don't love it, but I like it. I have I have a few of their albums, and uh, you know they're cool. They're unique for what they are. Uh, you know Harry Conklin is probably one of the best uh, you know power metal vocalists of all time, and uh, this might not be the best uh, Jag Panzer album, but it's really good. Um, you know it's not quite like their you know their debut album is considered an all time classic, just heavy metal, absolute classic. Uh, this is more along the lines of, you know, the power metal of the time that was important in the early 2000s that kind of, you know, again, that kind of uh, European, you know, sound, European power metal revival sound that was going on. I think even Jag Panzer were, you know, were, <laughs> were, uh, were paying attention to that because this is, to me, this has more of a European power metal style, but that's fine because I love that style. You know, I love, you know, the fast double bass songs and uh, you know, even keyboards, you know, bands like that that were using a lot of keyboards. I'm totally fine with that because I love keyboards and metal. Uh, yeah, I, this this is kind of awkward that this is the only Jag Panzer album that I have, but I, I always plan on getting more, and it's a, it, it's, it's a pretty good album for what it is. I think it's, uh, if you don't have it, I think it's well worth your time. And the last thing I'll be showing today is the debut album from Jerry Cantrell with Bogey Depot. Uh, do I even need to say who Jerry Cantrell is? He is the one of the founding members of Alice in Chains. He is basically uh, Alice in Chains, or pretty much his brainchild. Which you know he still uh, he still does stuff with them to this day, and he still does solo stuff. Uh, so this is the debut from '98. Uh, uh, he started doing solo stuff. I think he started this around 96. You know, he only has three solo albums, and uh, but this is a good one. Uh, maybe not my favorite, but it's certainly not my least favorite. That last one he did, I just thought was terrible. Uh, but this is a good album. This is very, very Alice in Chains, uh, maybe Jar of Flies era, which would make sense since he recorded this in uh, in 98 and started writing it probably around 96. You know, time time wise, that would make sense, and that you know that's arguably my favorite Alice in Chains uh, recording. So that's, uh, you know, I didn't always love this one. Uh, you know, I, I kind of liked it when it came out. Uh, you know, I shelved it for a long, long time. Uh, you know, I, I, this is an album I pull out every couple of years, and I seem to have different feelings every time I listen to it. But the last time I listened to it, uh, some years back, honestly, I, I, I do think it's really, really, really good. Um, I mean, Jerry's just such a fucking good songwriter. He's such a good musician. He, you know, he's just good at everything. He can sing. He, he can play guitar. He can play bass. I don't think he plays drums, but uh, who did he have play on this album, by the way? He has, I think he has uh, other, pretty much, I think most of the musicians on this album are, are, are Alice in Chains dudes. I think like uh, Mike Ine Inez and Sean Kinney, I think. Um, so, I mean, this is almost like a lost Alice in Chains album. It's, uh, it's good. It's a little on the mellow side. 
Um, but it's got some, it's got some rockers. Uh, you know, he'd come back some years after this with a uh, much, much, much heavier album, that, and that would be my favorite. I'll be showing that in, in the next video. But uh, any, uh, any Alice in Chains fans out there, uh, how do you feel about the Jerry Cantrell uh, solo material? Uh, do you like this one? Is this your favorite? Is it your least favorite? Let me know. And let me know, especially if you like Jaco Pastorius. Uh, as you can tell, I kind of struggled to talk about him and about that album just because I'm, I'm just not super, uh, super knowledgeable with it, with that fusion stuff. So uh, talk to me about Jaco Pastorius and uh, talk to me about anything, any of those albums. Uh, but most importantly, talk to me about talk to me about your cats and dogs. Uh, that's what really will get my attention. But anyways, uh, as always, thanks for stopping by. I love you guys. Louie loves you too. He's looking at me right now, uh, wondering why I'm just talking to the wall. But uh, anyways, yeah, let's talk, guys. Cheers. Talk soon.